Hello and welcome back to Beyond the Veil background information. Today we're doing another creature profile and it's about the Naga, so we're still in the serpent section of the Night Predators. Anyway, as usual I will do a, I'll start with a quote from where one is mentioned in a story. Then I'll give you all of my background information, you know, about the mythology of the creature and then I will give you a species profile for how it exists in the Veil. So I hope you'll find this interesting. Girish is a good man, well, Naga. He thwarted his own master's attempt to assassinate Uncle Tibble and Count Volturi, risking his life by helping my sister. It makes me laugh that they fell for one another so easily and that she's so happy. I suppose it's true what they say. Get on the good side of a Naga and you have loyalty for life. A quote from the last rattle. Now, when I say the word Naga, it is likely you think of two things depending on what you know. Firstly, you may think of the half-cobra, half-human form of Indian mythology, or you may think of the Thai dragon snake-like sculptures, if you've ever searched the term Thai Naga. Why? Well, shared mythos thanks to Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism. In fact, you'd probably be surprised how often the images appear in Southeast Asia, but also they're a heavy link to the cobra. In fact, when you know the sort of habitats cobras, especially king, co king cobras, are found in, you can see link, and hence Naga meaning serpent in Hindu, although interchangeable with meaning dragon, according to some, can sometimes be used in relation to cobras. Indeed, the scientific name for the Indian cobra is in fact Naga Naga. No matter where you find them, though, unlike serpents in the West, in the in the regions their stories exist, it is known that the Naga is wholly benevolent, divine or semi-divine, and said to be the children of Kadru and Rishi Kadru. Kashyapa. Sorry if my pronunciations are bad. They are described often in three forms with the ability to turn fully human. They are either a human upper half with snake lower half, a simple serpent, or a human with snakes from uh, with snakes coming from their head or neck, almost like a crown or a hood. Female Naga are called Nagi, Nagin or Nagini, and there is a Nagaraja that is the kingly title, and they all live in the Neverworld. To explain the Naga, it's much easier to separate between Hinduism, Buddhism and then the country interpretations, if only because each has a unique aspect to their Naga, and if you search Thai Naga, Hindu Naga or Cambodian Naga, you'll get some very different and similar statues to fascinate you. But first, I'll start with my introduction to the Naga. Once again, a storybook with different colourful pictures, uh, different colourful stories, told of a Naga princess guarding her three eggs, but the river washed her eggs away and they hatched further down the river, uh, further down. One of them hatched into a tiger, and I can't quite recall the rest, but that was all I knew about the Naga, and I never associated it with a dragon myself. But upon searching for dragons around the world and reading books about dragons, it always seemed to pop up as the Indian equivalent. But it's so unique and so very much a majestic being that I could never accept the argument myself, and always counted them as a wholly separate being. Now, let's talk about the Naga in Hinduism. Although some believe, uh, believe the Naga was inspired from Chinese dragon worship, it can be said that its origin seems to, be, seems to be with Hinduism. In Hinduism, the Naga is a special race of splendid, proud and wonderful beings that come from an underworld kingdom known as Patala Loka, I don't know if I'm saying that right, that is filled with gold and treasure of all sorts and appear taking on the roles of, and appear taking on the roles of, of beneficial protagonists to aid the world, protect treasures and aid deities. They are mortal enemies of the Garuda, the, giant, the guardian bird, but they are seen regularly in Hindu icono iconography as the half-snake, half-man, half the many-headed snake, and, uh, and allow deity to rest amongst their coils. One of the Nagaraja, the cosmic serpent Shesha, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, provides shelter for Vishnu and is often depicted in... Uh, and is often depicted as such, but as a devotee of Vishnu, Shesha takes human forms that are often the brothers of Vishnu's incarnations, playing roles in great stories throughout Hinduism, showing their benevolent and semi-divine roles. Then we move to Buddhism, where once again they perform similar roles and come from a special other world, but they are also guards to protect the devas at Mount Sumeru, and include water-dwelling members that serve the king of the western direction and have been taught by Buddha how to be and have been taught by Buddha how to become monks. In fact, a famous Nagaraja called Muka, Mukalinda protected and shielded the Buddha during some meditation after from a terrible storm with his seven snake heads. When the Buddha finished, Mukalinda or Mukalinda takes the form of a man from the priestly caste to pay homage to him. They can be depicted carrying jewels or even immortality or Amrita, and many of those important in Buddhist history hold Naga in their name. 
now let's talk about Nagas outside of India, country by country, as we as best we can see. In Sri Lanka, the origins of the country are said to be linked to a tribe known as the Naga people, who were described as a sort of superclass of human uh, superclass of humans that were actually some kind of snake people that could take human form. In the Philippines, the serpent-like moon-eating Bakunawa was developed with aspects of the Naga to it, but is not necessarily as benevolent as the Naga. In Pakistan, the shape sh- in Pakistan, the shape-shifting snake woman is very popular in film and pop culture. In Java and in Thailand, it is believed the, w- the Naga is a wealthy underworld deity. In other Indonesian culture, the Naga is depicted as a crowned giant serpent, sometimes with wings, and can be linked to fertility and water. But most of these islands only keep it in serpent form, save Borobudur, where it is seen in its human form. In Balinese tradition, they are linked more as deities to the underworld or neverworld, and often depicted and often depicted battling Garudas. In Laos, it was believed that Naga lived in sections of the, Me- sections of the Mekong River and were protectors of the city of Vientiane. They are also very important culturally, with poems using the Naga and Garuda in veiled discussion about relations between Laos and Thailand. In Malaysia, there is said to be a Naga in Lake Chini, where some legends say there is an ancient empire in the lake, but it is said this Naga's son or predecessor, depending on the various legends, went out to fight another Naga, a Naga curiously named the Laos word for Cambodia. Cambodia and, Th- Cambodia and Thailand, though, have possibly developed a much more vivid idea of the Naga. We'll start with Thailand first, because Cambodians' traditions are a bit heftier. But in Thailand, they are deemed water dwellers, with stories including one that the, Me- including one that the Mekong in the northeast near Laos was made by the rising of two King Naga. There are stories of fireballs observe- observed upon the Mekong that are associated to Naga, and sightings too, though some believe these are misidentified oarfish. The Sing the Sing Anavati Kingdom sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. In Northern Thailand was said to be was said to have been built with the aid of Nagas. Thus they were highly revered by the royalty there. They are connected to rainfall and thought to, to live in the Kamchanod forest, where it is believed the border between the Neverworld and the real world exists. Once again the Thai Naga is mostly depicted as the great serpent, often with a great crown and sometimes with several snake heads. It is thought to be responsible for random phenomena, phenomena like wave patterns on the water, and some suggest that the Naga is akin in modern thought as the Loch Ness Monster is. In Cambodia, though, stories of the Naga in Khmer, in Khmer tradition have been around a long time, with stories, of the Funan, with stories of the Funan state said to be established by an Indian prince who married a Naga princess. In fact, this story of Soma, the daughter of a great Naga king, and Prince Kaundinya, I don't know if I'm saying that right, goes a little like this. In a dream, the prince was told to take a magic bowl from a temple and defeat the princess, only to fall in love with her during the battle and the pair even married. They created the, king t- they created the kingdom together and indeed this kingdom would later be called Cambodia. In fact, it's such an important foundation story that wedding ceremonies, ceremonies are linked to it and the Khmer people traditionally believe themselves descendants of Naga, with hope that the Naga will reappear and bring back prosperity. Now, the Naga is the bringer of rain, bri- a bridge between the mortal realm and the heavenly, acting as protectors against all malicious intentions and forces. Plus, each Naga has a numerical significance upon their forehead, with odd numbers that are linked to immortality and masculinity, though the seven-headed is more femininity and mortality. A one-headed Naga is carved to give protection and symbolism that even with everything gone, one, na- one Naga can still bring happiness to all. A three-headed or Kalyak is born between realms, with each head representing the three realms. A five-headed, or sesak, is born from the earth and represents the five Buddhas, or the four directions and the middle. A seven-headed, or muchlentak, sorry if I'm pronouncing any of these wrong, (laughs) brings peace and prosperity and is linked to the seven colours of the rainbow. A nine-headed, or vasukak, is the king who is the king who rules the earth, and when carved with heads to the front and heads to the and heads to the back, represents reincarnation and death, and is linked to the nine realms. I've had to cut out a lot of information and trim a bit with the Cambodian ones, particularly because a lot of it is linked to Buddhism, so it can require a lot more discussion into Buddhism. But hopefully, that's given you a hint of their importance there. Indeed, I remember stumbling across a kid's cartoon that talked about the story of the prince and the naga. And, who, and how it was the foundation of the kingdom, and I was fascinated. It's not often you can see a being that's often relinquished to just another mythical monster outside Southeast Asia, having such a clearly defined position in a history. In a history. 
In fact, the Naga is a creature that's not given its due deserving in Western literature, and I believe should never, and I believe should never be put amongst the dragon category. Now, in the Vale, they are indeed a very important and benevolent species, although linked to the serpents of the night predators. The Naga often holds a better position in the modern understanding of species and gets respect, but they are often linked to the water and important for their own ability to travel at will in and out of the Vale and the water realm, where they are, where they are the protectors of all that lives within the waters of the Vale. Side light, created by, in Veil vale mythology, angels shedding, fi- shedding tears into the water. Created for, to develop guardians of the sacred waters that could protect the worlds beneath. Created when, during the Great Flood. Physical description, they can turn into beautiful humans that always pull attention and carry a noble air. But sometimes they can be human with a great number of snake heads about their shoulders or about their, or about their heads like a hood or as a giant many-headed serpent or as half snake, half human, sometimes with a cobra hood present at the back of the head. Abilities, they can travel in and out of the veil through water and guard many great treasures that can tell the, that can tell the future or give or gift rejuvenation to those deemed worthy. They are incredibly strong and can move the land apart to make deeper waterways and can breathe underwater as well as travel between fresh and salt. They can speak any language and have poison they can use if needed, but mostly their ability to hypnotise in order to calm others stands out as a point of their benevolence. Most known for being great sages of wisdom. Weaknesses, their human half is mortal if if pierced through the belly button or decapitated. Number, there are quite a few. Most of them dwell in the underwater cities of the Vale as the go-between, so it's assumed for how many... So it's assumed for how many are visible by the shore or on the land, double that lives beneath the water. So it's estimated there's at least 16 to 17,000 at the very most. Well-known beings, Girish Anaga that was taken into into work for the French vampire court, thanks to the help of Dragovai, performed an attempted poisoning of Count Volturi and later married her. Characters in stories, Girish appears in a few stories, but there is also room for more. Final comments. They shouldn't be amongst the serpents and night predators of the Vale, but like with other, but like with others, their loyalty and work within the royal courts of the Vampire Elite put them in a dark position as well as their snake link. But I hope you found them interesting all the same. Thank you for listening. Bye.